Hey, it's uh, great to be back at Faith Bridge. I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving and it's fun to transition towards Christmas with with you. I want to start this morning just by sharing with you about a trip that I took with my middle son, Andrew, who's eight years old. We took a, a man trip together about a month ago. And uh, here's the deal. We tried to cram everything that Andrew wanted to do into about a 48-hour period. And so uh, we started off in Glen Rose, Texas at Dinosaur World. Good chance you've never been to Dinosaur World, but that's where we went. Uh, That was our first stop. And then we made our way to Grapevine, Texas. And we went to Bass Pro Shops because he had seen it on Dude Perfect and he loves Dude Perfect. So we were at Bass Pro Shops. I'm more indoorsy than outdoorsy, but I did my best. All right, I tried. And then we went to Great Wolf Lodge where we stayed the night, which is basically a massive water park attached to a hotel. And then uh, our trip culminated at uh, AT AT&T Stadium, Cowboys Stadium for Monster Jam, which is a monster truck rally. And so that was my man weekend with Andrew. And man, Andrew just came alive at every stop on the trip. Now, it's very important for you to know that going into the trip, I made a commitment to myself that I was going to try and say the word no to Andrew as few times as possible. Like my goal during the trip was to simply say yes to everything. So, hey, Dad, can I get some cotton candy at Bass Pro Shops? I'm like, I didn't know that Bass Pro Shops was known for their cotton candy. We're probably the only people who have gone to Bass Pro Shops and only bought cotton candy, but if that's what you want, absolutely. Okay, Andrew, you see all of these amazing water slides. Oh, you just want to go and spray the people in the lazy river again. Sure, if that sounds good to you, let's go do that. You want to go back to the arcade, the overpriced arcade again? Great. I think that that's a great option. You want a fourth dessert for today? Yeah, you should definitely do that. That sounds like a great idea. Oh, you want the overpriced $25 t-shirt from Monster Jam? Why wouldn't you want that? And why wouldn't I buy that for you? Yes, we are getting that t-shirt. That was my goal throughout the trip was to never tell Andrew no. Well, we uh, finished Monster Jam, which was the climax of the trip. And we're walking out of Monster Jam, and I'm just going to be honest with you, at this point, I was, I was all out of yeses. Like, I was just, <laughs> my yeses got burned up inside of Monster Jam, because we jo- dropped some serious cash in Monster Jam. I was already deep in at Monster Jam. We had gotten the $10 nachos that he didn't touch. We had gotten the $11 souvenir cup. $11 for a cup, people. We got that. We got the $25 t-shirt for Monster Jam. We got the Dippin' Dots, which I, don't, I didn't even want to know how much they cost. I was just, take my card. Just take it. Run it. Don't tell me. Just give it back, and I'll see it in a month. But that, that's where I was at at that point. And then we are walking out of Monster Jam, and there in the parking lot is a man with a cardboard box, And he is selling toys out of his cardboard box. He's selling these little neon twirly things for I don't even know how much money. And Andrew's like, Dad, can I get one of those things? And I was like, dude, we are not going to get one of those things. And he looked at me and he goes, why? (laughs) And in that moment, I was like, oh, That word no has been foreign to Andrew for about 48 hours, and now there's a man with a cardboard box with some really overpriced neon twirly things that would be broken in about 10 minutes. And now I'm telling him no, and he hasn't heard that word in a while. And then we got back to College Station, we were sitting on the couch together, and Andrew was just wiped out at this time. I have an amazing eight-year-old son. He is great. This wasn't his best moment, but he is a great kid. He was just wiped out at the time, and I said something to him on the couch, and he snapped at me. Not snapped, but snapped (laughs) at me. And in that moment, I realized that I was reintroducing instruction and boundaries and accountability. And it was just a lot more fun when dad didn't know the word. No. 
And the reason that I share that with you is as I thought about that experience with Andrew, here's the realization that I had about Christianity. In our world today, Christianity has really become the unwelcomed father figure that is trying to introduce boundaries and instruction and accountability to a culture that is permanently on vacation. Like, I don't know if you realize that, but we live in a world and Christianity is trying to introduce boundaries, instruction, and accountability to a culture that is permanently in love with the word yes. We don't know the word no, and so there has never been a greater time in our world for people to be empowered to be whoever they want to be and do whatever they want to do. Like, we live in a culture that wants to say yes to everything, and so when Christianity shows up and seeks to introduce boundaries and instruction and accountability to a culture that doesn't want it, then the only word appropriate for describing Christianity is the word intolerant. And so I even share that with you this morning. Is I, I share that because today and next Sunday, I want to answer two difficult but very important questions. This morning, I want to answer the question, what's up with, what's up with Christians being so intolerant? And then next Sunday, I want to answer the question, what's up with Christianity being so exclusive? It's the question, why do Christians think that Jesus is the only way? And so... If you're a guest here or like you're just in town visiting family and your family was like, hey, let's go get brunch. And then they drove you to Faith Bridge and you got tricked. Like you picked a great Sunday to be here talking about intolerance. But the reason that this is so important is because if we were to pull the unbelievers in your life, like if we were to go and pull the people in your work or if we were to pull the people at your gym or in your neighborhood that are not Christians, I wouldn't be surprised if it would show that Christians are viewed as unintelligent, out of touch, brainwashed, and as those standing on the wrong side of history on the biggest issues of our day, such as sexual orientation, gender identity, women's rights, and the coexistence of religious beliefs. In a word, Christians are intolerant. It's interesting um, that the reason that this discussion needs to happen is because the word tolerance means something different now than it meant a decade ago. Like the definition of tolerance has changed. And so the reason I want to have this conversation is because we need to know if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to know what you're up against. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, there's a good chance that, that there's some frustration in you towards Christianity. And I just want to deal with it this morning. And it has to start with us understanding how you even define tolerance today. Because the definition has changed. And I don't even know if you realize that it has changed. Let me just tell you what the definition of tolerance once was. Like if you were to go and Google the word tolerance, if you were to go look it up, you would actually get the old definition of tolerance. The old definition of tolerance is this. And this isn't my definition. This is not a Christian definition. This is just the definition of tolerance how it used to be defined. Tolerance would have been defined as a willingness to accept behavior and beliefs that are different from your own, even if you disagree with or disapprove of them. So that is very important for you to see that acceptance does not equal approval. Like it was possible at one point to be considered tolerant and to accept a person while still disapproving of and disagreeing with their beliefs or behavior. So relationships could look like this. You could enter into a relationship with someone and it could be the type of relationship where you say, hey, I think I'm right and you're wrong and you think you're right and you think I'm wrong. You know what, we could both be wrong here. But we can enter into intelligent and respectful dialogue with, we, with each other, and we can disagree with each other, but even after disagreeing, we can walk away respecting each other. 
That's the old definition of tolerance. And, and we've seen that definition of tolerance resurface recently around Ellen DeGeneres. Like, I don't know if you saw what happened maybe a month, month and a half ago, but Ellen was spotted on TV at a Dallas Cowboy football game sitting right next to George W. Bush. And when, when people on social media saw this picture, they lost their ever-loving mind. And so Ellen went on her show and she explained her situation. Here's what she said. And we see the old definition of tolerance surface. She said this. She said, I'm friends with George Bush. In fact, I'm friends with a lot of people who don't share the same beliefs that I have. But just because I don't agree with someone on everything doesn't mean that I'm not going to be friends with them. When I say be kind to one another, I don't only mean the people that think the same way that you do. I mean be kind to everyone. But the interesting thing is if you were to go and look on Ellen's Twitter feed, she got roasted by people for her explanation of why she's friends with George W. Bush. Why? Because the definition of tolerance has changed. Here's how it's changed. Tolerance is no longer defined as acceptance in which there can be disagreement or disapproval. Tolerance has moved from acceptance to approval and celebration. That's what tolerance is now. Tolerance is now acceptance and approval and celebration of all beliefs and behavior. So now relationships must look like this. You're right and I'm right. Like we can believe two totally different things. We can behave in two totally different ways, but you're right and I'm right. And I expect you to uh, approve of and celebrate all of my beliefs and all of my behavior. And you should expect me to celebrate all of your beliefs and all of your behavior. And if you don't celebrate all of my beliefs and all of my behavior, then you are at best intolerant and at worst, you are hateful and a bigot. That is the new definition of tolerance. That's why people hate it when Christians use the phrase, hey, love the sinner, hate the sin. Like if you're one of those people who uses that phrase, unbelievers hate that. So we should probably stop saying it simply because it is adhering to a definition of tolerance that is now extinct. Because what you're saying when you say, hey, I love the sinner, I just hate the sin, what you're saying is, I accept you, but I disapprove of some of your beliefs and behavior. Well, the new definition of tolerance says, no, 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 no. Your beliefs and your behavior are right, and so are mine. And so I celebrate your beliefs and behavior, and you celebrate mine. It's interesting, as I was preparing for this message, like I, I, I kept getting jammed up on what direction I wanted to go. Like I sat in front of my computer for hours, going nowhere, because I kept looking for like my slant. Like how was I going to like build up this argument of like people think Christians are intolerant, but bam, we're actually really tolerant. Like where's my right hook? And then here's the realization that I came to. The realization I came to was this. If Christianity's tolerance is going to be evaluated against the new definition of tolerance, which is Christianity must approve of and celebrate all beliefs and behavior, then Christianity will always be viewed as intolerant. Like it will. Like there is no slant, there is no swerve here where I can be like, no, we're actually, it is possible for us to celebrate all beliefs and behavior. No, in the process of formulating this talk, I realized I'm actually intolerant. If I am being evaluated against the new definition of tolerance, then I'm very intolerant. If I'm being evaluated according to the old definition of tolerance, I believe I'm very tolerant. But if I'm being evaluated according to the new de definition, then people will always view me as intolerant. So here's what I want to do this morning. If you're a 
passionate follower of Jesus Christ, then here's what I want to do. I want to make sure that you are equipped to enter into meaningful dialogue with people who disagree with you and communicate in a way that is full of truth, but also very, very gracious. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you're one of those people who's sitting there saying, yeah, I do think Christians are intolerant, then here's what I want to do this morning. My goal isn't to convince you that I'm right and I don't need you to agree with me, but I hope that we might be able to revert back to the old definition of tolerance, at least for this morning, where you can leave here saying, you know what, I don't agree with them, but I do feel respected and I do feel like Christians can be very gracious and loving while taking a different direction than I do. And then let me say this before I proceed any further. I wanna make sure you know I am speaking on behalf of biblical followers of Jesus Christ. Like there are people in this world who would position themselves under the umbrella of Christianity and that's not Christianity at all. They are actually operating under the umbrella of hate. Like they put up billboards and they hold up signs that declare who God hates. And I just want to be clear, those aren't my people. And I don't speak for them this morning. But what I want to do is I just want to share with you a few reasons why Christians will always be viewed as intolerant as long as we are being evaluated according to the new definition of tolerance. The first reason why Christians will always be viewed as intolerant, as long as we are evaluated according to the new definition is this, we still believe in absolute truth and morality. We still believe in absolute truth and morality. See, we live in a time where relativism rules. Relativism is the idea that there is no objective truth and there is no objective morality. You can be right and I can be right at the same time. Differing beliefs can can coexist and be equally valid. But as Christians, we believe that there are beliefs that are true and there are beliefs that are actually false because we still believe that there's absolute truth. Now, if you're one of those people who are like, you know what, there is no absolute truth. I just need you to understand you're having to use an absolute statement to say that there is no absolute truth. So if you're saying there is no absolute truth, let me just ask you, is that absolutely true? Because if you're sitting there saying there is no absolute truth, well, we can at least agree that there's one absolute truth, that there is no absolute truth, but that's contradictory in and of itself. So if there's at least one absolute truth, it's possible that there's more absolute truth, and we as Christians believe that that is the case. And when it comes to morality, we still believe in moral absolutism. We don't believe that everything in this world is gray morally. See, if you get to a point where you say, you know what, there is no absolute morality, like you have to figure out what is best and right for you. If you want to remove the concept of objective morality, then here's what you have to do. You have to get to a place where you are comfortable and confident adding the two words for me to any discussion about morality. Like, you have to be okay saying things like, you know what, rape is wrong for me. Like, mass killings on college campuses are wrong for me. Like, human trafficking, sexual abuse, inequality, racism, these things are wrong for me. Because you at least have to leave the door open that these things might be wrong for you, but they are actually, they can be good and right for other people in this world. You have to be okay with that if you're going to maintain intellectual integrity. So people might respond and say, well, I, the, the reality is I can say that things like rape and human trafficking, they're wrong for me, but But the good thing is, is that culture has established what is right and what is wrong. And so rape isn't just wrong for me, like our our culture has established that it is wrong 
for everybody in our culture. Well, let me just ask you, what if culture changes? What if culture reaches a point where they say, you know what, we've decided rape is actually okay. Are you going to change with it? Because if something inside of you says, you know what, I just can't fathom a time when rape would ever be okay. Do you understand that you are actually appealing to an objective standard of morality? What you're saying is, I cannot fathom a time or place where it would actually ever be okay for someone to separate someone's soul from their body. See, you have to understand what is actually firing off in your soul because uh, truth and morality cannot be a buffet where you say, you know what, I, I really want to believe in subjective truth here, but when it comes to objective morality, I'm going to say no in this situation. It's not a buffet. It either is or it isn't. So if there's times in your life where, or to say mass shootings are wrong and you don't feel comfortable adding the two words for me like if there's something in you that's saying you know what I cannot fathom a time and place where mass shootings on a college campus could ever be good or right what is happening is your soul is actually naturally and instinctively appealing to an objective standard that declares that every person in this world has inherent dignity and value and worth because they've been created in the image of God. That's actually what is happening in your soul, whether you want to realize it or not. And so we just need to be clear. If we want to maintain intellectual integrity, there is an objective standard of morality. Now, I've sat with a kid on a college campus, on Texas A&M's campus, and he said, you know what, I'm comfortable saying that these things are wrong for me. And I respect him for at least maintaining intellectual integrity in his life. But let's just be clear. You know what, a world with no absolute truth and no objective morality is a world with no shame. And when I say no shame, I'm not talking about like, oh, thank goodness, we've been freed by Jesus Christ from shame. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a world where people no longer see anything evil as wrong. We live, to, to continue down this course is a world where people no longer feel regret or remorse for acts of evil. And so humanism often believes that we're the answer to the problem, that we're just, we just need to be better. How can, how can we be the solution to the situation when we're saying, you know what, we don't want any accountability, objective accountability for right and wrong. It, it doesn't make sense. And we say, well, no, culture defines it. But culture is constantly changing. We believe as Christians we still believe that there is absolute truth in an objective standard of morality. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some ideas of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it just? Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, you don't know that a line is crooked unless you've first seen a straight line. As Christians, we believe we've seen that straight line. God is that straight line. We know good and not good because God is the standard of good. When you open up the scriptures and you read Genesis 1, what do you see? You see God creating and defining what is good. You read Genesis 2, what do we see God say when he sees Adam in the garden isolated with no one? He says, it is not good for man to be alone. God is the one who has established what is good and what is not good. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world, who is, was, and is the embodiment of truth. And then Jesus left and sent his spirit, and his spirit inspired men to write the scriptures. And in this book, God establishes what is good and what is right <coughs> and what is not right. See, we believe that God is the one who has established objective truth and morality. Now, if you're an unbeliever in the room, I don't expect you to agree with me. I just need you to know where we're coming from. We take this book very seriously. Here's the deal. If God has spoken, wouldn't you want to hear what he has to say? 
Like if, if you were to get a text message tonight that says, this is God, I want to talk to you in the morning, how would you respond? Most of you would delete it and be like, I'm getting pranked by somebody. But if you had a way of knowing that that was God, like, would you sleep in the next morning and be like, you know what, snooze? No. If the God of the universe wanted to speak to you, I promise you, you'd wake up with pitters. Like you would, your voice would crack when you answer the phone. You'd be like, hello, um, is this, you know, when you see out of area, you'd be like, okay, this is the real deal. Like this is, God has spoken. He's spoken. We believe that he's spoken. We believe that he's given us instruction. So this book is the standard for for our lives. I don't need you to agree, but I do need you to hear that this book has mounds of historical evidence pointing to its reliability and validity. And if you haven't read it, you need to give it a read. Like if you consider yourself well-read, but you haven't read the Bible, that's an oxymoron because this is the best-selling book of all time. So how can you be well-read and not have read the best-selling book of all times? Like if you've never read it except for a few verses and you're like, yeah, I don't agree with that. I know what the rest says. No, you don't. And so let me just say God has spoken. And because of that, we submit ourselves to his authority. The second reason that we as Christians will always be considered intolerant as long as we're evaluated by the new definition of tolerance is because we still believe that God is the ultimate authority. See, here's the thing. In our culture today, individualism and relativism go hand in hand. Individualism is the idea that you get to be king. You get to decide what is best for you. Life is all about you and what you want so you have control of your life. But we believe the scriptures are true and listen now the scriptures position Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter two verses nine through 11 says this, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This, This pictures Jesus Christ as the king of all kings. That every knee will bow before him. So here's the thing. How dangerous is it to make yourself God when there already is a God? Like how dangerous is it for you to be king of your life when there already is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords? So we as Christians, we submit ourselves to his authority. What he says goes. Whatever he asks of us, we will do. Whatever he defines as truth, that will be our definition of truth. Whatever he deems as right behavior, that will be the behavior that we elevate and behavior that's in opposition to it. We, we, we cannot celebrate and approve of it. Here's the good news. God is never on the wrong side of history and Jesus is a good king. The third reason that we as Christians will always be considered intolerant as long as we're being evaluated by the new definition is this, and this is so important, don't miss this. We still define love differently. We still define love differently. See, one of the big arguments against Christians when it comes to intolerance is this. Um, How can you be so intolerant when your Bible says that God is love. God is love. And when people use that phrase, God is love, what they do is they lean on the new definition of tolerance and they equate love to the new definition of tolerance. God is love, therefore God approves of and celebrates all beliefs and behavior. The the only problem with that argument is that you are actually hijacking a verse from scripture and you're removing it from the context in which it was written and you're making the Bible say what you want it to say instead of what it actually says. Let me just show you the passage in the Bible where God is love is found. Listen to this in 1 John chapter four. Listen to what it says, verse seven. It says, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Amen. 
Oh my goodness, that is, he, man, let, let's just stop there and pray and get out of here. Like if, if you don't love, then you don't know God. God is love. Love everyone. Approve of everyone. Celebrate everyone's beliefs and behavior. But watch how it goes on. Verse, verse 9 says this, In this the love of God was made man, man, manifest among us. So here's what that means. God is love. Now this is how God shows that he is love. This is how we know his love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This verse right here presupposes that we are people who are spiritually dead and need to be made alive. So that is why God had to leave heaven and come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ because we are spiritually dead people in need of someone to bring us to life. Then it goes on and says this, in this is love. So this is just spelling it out. God is love, in this is love. This is a clarifying statement of what love truly is. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That's a big word, impressive word that you take to lunch with your friends today and be like, have you ever heard of the word propitiation? Clearly you haven't. Let me tell you what it is. You're going to impress a lot of people, but he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Do you know what that word propitiation means? It means satisfaction, and it's referring to the wrath of God. It's saying the wrath of God was coming and what Jesus did was he stepped in and he went to the cross and he satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf. Why was the wrath of God coming? Why was Jesus a propitiation? He was a propitiation for our sins. So it's saying God doesn't celebrate and approve of all beliefs and behavior. There's actually beliefs and behavior that necessitated the wrath of God to come. In Jesus Christ, in love, because God is love, inserted himself and satisfied the wrath of God for you and for me. We still define love differently, so let me just be clear on how we as Christians define love. First, love understands that everyone is broken. Love understands that everyone is broken, and unbelievers hate when I say that we're all broken, because unbelievers hear that, and they're like, I'm not broken. Like, I don't feel like things feel pretty good in life right now. Like, I don't feel like anything needs fixing. But let's just acknowledge that this world is broken, right? Like, we live in a world that is very broken. I mean, just think about, you know, just... This week, we're dealing with stabbings in London. It, I mean, at any point in the year, we're talking about mass shootings, we're talking about rape, we're talking about human trafficking, and we're not even touching the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the evil in this world. This world is a broken place. And our tendency is to think that this world is broken because of some weirdos out there. But let's just boil it down. What is at the root of of evil in this world. Let me just identify for you the main forces at play in our world today that cause evil. Here they are, selfishness, pride, abuse of power, lust, hate, and greed. All, even, all evil in the world can be boiled down to these things right here. So let me just ask you, you ever struggle with selfishness? Oh, only me? I'm the only one in here that struggles? Hey, let's get real. If you're a parent, you know you didn't have to teach your kids how to be selfish. They just got it from the womb. Like I've never sat my three do boys down and been like, okay, here's the deal. We're going to go on a play date and some kids are going to want to play with your toy. And when they do, you grip it. <laughs> and you say, mine. No, they, they bat a thousand percent at that. They're super good at being selfish. I have not had to teach them. That's one of their greatest strengths is they're selfish. Like they, it is their natural talent. All right. We just Hey, just today, who have you thought most about? Come on. What time do I want to wake up? What do I want to eat for breakfast? Do I want to exercise this morning? Definitely not. Um, <laughs> do I want to go to church this morning? Do, it, it's us. We, we think most naturally about number one. The 
Selfishness comes now. What about pride? You ever think that you're better than other people? You're like, no, I don't think that. Well, okay. Have you ever experienced the slightest gratification of knowing that you're smarter, prettier, funnier, stronger, more in shape, more likable, or godlier than other people? That, that's pride. Abuse of power. Have you ever used someone to get what you want? Lust. Do you ever look at pornography? Do you ever remove someone's humanity from them by just seeing them for their body parts? Greed. Have you ever been stingy with your money? And like Ken didn't ask me to insert this right here because of the whole legacy thing. <laughs> like duh, this is not that move right now. I'm just asking you. Like have you ever kind of gripped your money too tight? Like have you ever not... Okay, when's the last time that you spent your money on someone other than yourself or your immediate family? Greed is a struggle. What about hate? Like, have you ever gotten keyboard courage and blasted someone on social media or over email? I mean, come on. Like, we're not the answer to the problem. We are the problem. We are the problem. Humanists want to say, like, let's just, we can figure out that we, it's just, we just need to be good enough and this world is going to get better. How is that working out for us? Not great. So love knows that everyone is broken. That's why the verse said that Jesus had to be the propitiation for our sins, because we're all sinners. Love also knows that everyone is spiritually dead. That's why Jesus had to come so that we could live through him, because Without Jesus, we're spiritually dead, physically alive, but spiritually dead. What does that mean to be spiritually dead? It means that we are all, by nature, separated from God. And it's not that we're spiritually bad and we just need to start being spiritually good so God can truly love us. No, the Bible pictures us as spiritually dead. What that means is we are incapable of doing anything that will please God enough for him to truly love us how uh, love us with his perfect love. So if love knows that everyone is broken and love knows that everyone is spiritually dead, love wants people to live. That's what love is. Love is a desire for people to live. What does it mean for people to live? It means to be made right with God, that we want people to be made right with God, that Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth, was punished in our place, so that through faith in him, we could be made right with a perfect God. And we can receive a new, ed- new identity. Instead of being enemies with God, the God of the universe looks at us and calls us his children when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know what this means? It means that you're more than what you do. You're more than your sexuality. The most important thing that could ever be said about you is what God says about you. If God looks at you and calls you his son or daughter, that's the truest statement of you that there will ever be. And that's your identity. To live is to walk in forgiveness. It's to know that you're not defined by your past. You're not defined by what you've done. You're defined by what Jesus Christ has done for you. And to live is to walk in freedom. A pastor friend reminded me that freedom isn't just being able to do what you want. Sometimes freedom is being able to not do the things you naturally want to do. And freedom is also being able to do some things you don't naturally want to do. So listen to me on this. Just think, if you're an unbeliever in here, again, I don't need you to agree with me this morning. But just understand If we as Christians believe that this is what's on the table, if a right relationship with God and a new identity and complete freedom and complete forgiveness in life itself is on the table, if that is what is at stake, how unloving would it be for us to be tolerant? Like how unloving would it be for us to celebrate and approve of all beliefs and behavior? If this is what is truly on the table, how unloving would that truly be? It reminds me of what Penn Jillette said in a, in a post, once Penn Jillette's famous magician, Penn and Teller, he's an outspoken atheist, and after one of his shows, a Christian came up and gave him a copy of the New Testament, and uh, 
Penn Gillette was really moved by it, and so he just took a selfie video, and here's what he said in it. He said, I've always said, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect them at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, and atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize and who say, just leave me along and Keep your religion to yourself. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. This... This is, why, this is why we share Jesus. And this is why we still hold to objective truth and objective morality. That's why we still treasure this book and submit, or, submit ourselves to his leadership. And this is why we still have a different definition of love. Let me just close by just saying this. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, our model is Jesus Christ. Our model is Jesus Christ. One of the most common emotions that Jesus felt was compassion. Jesus moved close to those whom society rejected. He pursued those who believed and behaved differently, but he didn't withdraw in judgment. He pursued in love. Jesus was able to love people without celebrating everything about him. The dead came to life with Jesus. People rejected Jesus, but with Jesus, the worst of sinners will be in heaven. So let me just close by saying this. If you're a passionate follower of Jesus Christ, what do you do with a message like this? Well, you evaluate your life. If your life looks more like hate than a Christ-like love, you need to repent and even ask forgiveness of those whom you've been hateful towards. And if you're not a believer of Jesus Christ, what do you do with a message like this? Well, let me just say this. How unfortunate would it be for you to walk out of here believing that God is still that unwelcome father figure seeking to invoke rules and instruction and boundaries and accountability to steal your joy when he's actually a perfectly, he's a perfect heavenly father who gave his son to have you. And he's not trying to rip you off, he's trying to set you free. So would you come? Let's pray together. In a moment, we're going to give back to God. We're going to give our tithes and offerings in both venues this morning. But before we do that, let's just do business with the Lord right now. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, just evaluate in your own life. Does your life reflect the type of love that we're talking about? A love that knows that everyone is broken and everyone is separated from God. Everyone is spiritually dead. Does your life display a love that wants everyone to live? And if not, just ask God. Say, God, do a new work in my life. I pray that my life would reflect your love really well. And then if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ... Would you just know the invitation that's on the table? Some of you are sitting there this morning saying, I am spiritually dead, and I want Jesus to make me alive today. And if that's you, would you just invite Christ into your life right now? You can just pray and say, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sins? And would you begin to lead me in a new life as my Savior and as my King? Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. God, I pray that we as Christians would represent you well in this world. And we might always be viewed as intolerant. But my prayer is that people could see us as as ambassadors of your love. That if people really got to know us and we really got to know them, they would know that there's a burning love in our hearts for them to truly live. So use us, God, for your glory. 
In Jesus' name, amen.